Two countries in the Indian subcontinent are grappling with a deepening economic crisis. The economic mismanagement in Sri Lanka triggered major political turmoil and Pakistan has its own share of economic concerns. The Pakistani rupee has plunged to an all-time low against the dollar. Two friends of China are facing economic challenges. The Chinese President Xi Jinping has been reluctant, meanwhile, to pull out the checkbook for Sri Lanka. The economic crisis in Sri Lanka has transformed into a political crisis. The streets of Colombo witnessed mayhem and violent clashes. But China has not responded to Sri Lanka's pleas for $2.5 billion in credit support. China has been hesitant in helping its all-weather friend Pakistan as well. Both Sri Lanka and Pakistan are burdened under debt from China. Last month, before approaching the International Monetary Fund for help, Sri Lanka had unilaterally suspended external debt repayments. China is one of Sri Lanka's largest bilateral lenders. 10% of the island nation's debt is from China, nearly 10% of it also from Japan. So China alone cannot bail out Sri Lanka. But for weeks now, the IMF loan program for Sri Lanka has been under discussion. The IMF says it requires adequate assurances that Sri Lanka's debt can be put on a sustainable path. For now, it has asked Sri Lanka to restructure its debt before a bailout. Sri Lanka then turned to one of its biggest lenders, China, to restructure the debt. China expressed apprehension over, reach over Sri Lanka seeking a bailout package from the IMF. Beijing warned that such a move would impact the ongoing credit talks. Days later, Beijing made a U-turn. China now says that it backs Sri Lanka's decision to work with the IMF to restructure its debt. Beijing played hardball earlier but ultimately gave in. Sri Lanka has received assurances from China and the IMF. However, there has been no progress so far. And problems for bankrupt Pakistan are also mounting. It's all whether ally China is not helping with the debt crisis. The over-dependence on China for economic development has clearly not gone well. Both Pakistan and Sri Lanka were supposed to be the biggest beneficiaries of the so-called economic assistance from China, but instead of becoming more resilient, they landed in an economic mess. Disappointed and let down, Pakistan turned to Saudi Arabia. The new Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif met with the Saudi Crown Prince and got much-needed reprieve in the form of an $8 billion bailout. According to the World Bank, Pakistan owes one-fifth of its external debt to China. In March this year, China did accept Pakistan's request to roll over a whopping $4.2 billion debt repayment to provide major relief. The then Prime Minister Imran Khan, during his meeting with Xi Jinping in February, had made a request for a rollover, which would be financial relief for the crisis-hit Pakistan economy. Over the past few years, China has been accused of using debt trap diplomacy to make developing countries dependent on Beijing. So why is China not helping its friends? Beijing has been hesitant to interfere in messy domestic political situations. China is also one of the world's largest single creditor nations. It is carrying a lot of debt with countries where the prospects of paying back are rather limited. Its state-owned policy banks have been lending more to developing countries than the IMF and World Bank. In some recent years, all this comes on top of a tightening economic situation at home. China is facing its own economic concerns and troubles. Strict and long COVID-19 lockdowns have shut down its major cities. Its official growth target of 5.5% is also in jeopardy. Experts say China's role in helping to resolve the ongoing crisis in South Asia may be limited despite its status as a major creditor. New credit lines are now harder to approve as authorities emphasize risk management. After years of an all-out push, Beijing has chosen a cautious approach even for its high-level Belt and Road Initiative. So China lent out heavily to both Sri Lanka and Pakistan. Both allies over the years praised Xi Jinping, bet on Chinese investments. Basically, they made a deal with the devil. 
But Beijing now seems to have abandoned both countries, leaving them high and dry. And now it is waiting to see what efforts other actors, like the international financial institutions, will be making before they jump in to offer credit support. Currently, India's neighborhood is in deep economic turmoil. Sri Lanka, Pakistan, also Nepal, all three countries are tackling a financial crisis. While India has been supporting Sri Lanka in its path of economic recovery, reports say the new Shahbaz government in Pakistan is pushing for resumption of commercial ties with New Delhi. And let's go straight across now to Atul Aneja, who's joining us on the broadcast for more perspectives on this. He's the editor of India Narrative. Thanks very much for being here with us. Like I just mentioned, uh, China has not responded to Sri Lanka's desperate pleas for the $2.5 billion in credit support, uh, while the crisis in Colombo has been spiraling out of control. What do you make of that? Well, uh, China is going to... Uh reappraisal of its own foreign policy. And that is uh, primarily driven by its own economic uh, compulsions. Uh, after COVID uh, situation, uh, China's export markets have uh, have dwindled. And uh, internally, there is some dissent. Uh, and there are, uh, along with that, geopolitical push against China, uh, which is uh, very strong. And on top of that, China is uh, about to uh, go towards this 20th party congress, not about to, but in a few months' time, which will actually decide Xi Jinping's uh, things fate, uh, fate uh, for the next five years at least, if not more. So uh, at this time, they'll be cautious. I don't think uh, the Chinese are going to do anything which upsets a domestic economy beyond what it is already uh, in situation it is in. So frankly, it's internal consolidation phase for China in the post-COVID era. And... Uh, Fortunately, unfortunately, uh, the countries it was supporting earlier in South Asia, you mentioned Pakistan, especially through CPEC project. And frankly, the Belt and Road projects are, are the ones which are the white elephants. So they're going to slow on that. So CPEC is something the Chinese have invested for years, according to uh, officials in the new Shabazz Sharif government. And uh, same goes uh, with uh, Sri Lanka. And uh, I think that's going also to going to be case with the other developing countries. China inward looking phase, trying internal consolidation in a very fluid situation. On top of that, we have the Ukraine uh, situation as well, which is putting additional pressure on China because China and Russia are close allies now. And uh, that particular bonding is not liked by the West. It's also interesting, Molly, that not that the West is very strong at this time. They themselves are undergoing a huge problem. Uh, and uh, we are in a multipolar era where power has got dispersed. But a new situation is yet to emerge, a new hierarchy is yet to emerge. So we are in that fluidity, and China is definitely at the centerpiece of that. So uh, this is going to continue for a long time till the international system settles uh, to what Americans like to call a new rule-based order. It is not right now uh, because of various reasons, which I mentioned, COVID and Ukraine situation, Afghanistan. Etc. So geopolitical reasons are, are, are making big dents in the geoeconomics of these countries making them turn in, inward looking. And as a result, countries like Sri Lanka and Pakistan and other developing countries are going to suffer much more. I don't think Sri Lanka is the only case. Uh, I think many African countries are also going to go under right. quite soon. And on top of that, we are going to have a food crisis because a lot of the food which is produced in the Black Sea uh, region uh, in Ukraine, uh, Russia belt is no longer going to be in the supply chains or going to be in a very restricted way. So this is going to be a perfect storm uh, and countries are suffering and countries are going inward, uh, are going inward and trying to protect their interests as best as they can. Right. If you can elaborate on the role that China's debt trap diplomacy has played in the economic crisis in Sri Lanka and Pakistan. Uh, Molly, there was a phase uh, and this I'm talking about 2012, 2013. And I was in China at that time. The mood was, you know, that we have arrived and it was an extrovert kind of a mood that now is a time for the Chinese century to come in. 
And there was a hubris which came along with that, that, you know, we have been a developing country for so long, but now is the time. And this was actually nailed in the 19th party Congress by Xi Jinping himself. 2020, we remove uh, extreme poverty. 2035, we become the number one economy of the world, uh, you know, outgunning the US. And 2050, we become the most developed in the entire universe. So, you know, that was the kind of hubris and the confidence uh, which was there in the Chinese uh, setup at that point. And it, it is in this context of that kind of a mindset that the Belt and Road Initiative comes in. And when you are, you know, uh, ideologically driven as China was at that time, then uh, fiscal prudence, uh, you know, testing your projects goes downhill because there is an artificial uh, belief in your own ability that if you have arrived so far, become the workshop of the world and created these massive cities of Shanghai and others into world-class metropolis, that you can take on anything. But that is where it is, is the problem uh, with, with nations which punch beyond their weight. And this is exactly what the Chinese did. They radiated all over to their economic corridors. I mentioned CPEC. There's one with Myanmar called the China-Myanmar Economic Corridor. Then they move along uh, into Eurasia through Kazakhstan and Central Asia, reaching out right up to Turkey, Armenia, and then we drop lines into, into Africa. And then you have these massive railway systems coming up in Africa. For example, the Mombasa uh, rail line, uh, which goes, you get into Zambia. And also Angola, you want to capture all the rare earth minerals right. of the world because you anticipate an electric uh, car, uh, electric vehicle revolution where rare earths and your uh, lithium, et cetera, are going to be critical. So you go all out into Africa as well as part of this Belt and Road Initiative. And that's where you punch beyond your weight. You invest so much into unsustainable projects and regions, the money is not going to come back to you. And, and on top of that, when COVID happened and the stark economic realities came, the growth rate projections of China started going down. Now it's 4.5%, where they're going to 6 to 7, and 1% above 10%. Uh, for the, for nearly a decade or more. So all that has come crashing down. And therefore, there is a deep churning within the Communist Party of China, a, a, a moment for review of all these projects. So yes. you want to look front and look at your own sustainability first, rather than bailing someone out. And that's in, in that review, you find that, you know, Sri Lanka or Pakistan uh, really are not that great uh, priority for you. Pakistan perhaps is, but Indian Ocean ambitions through Sri Lanka, I mean, it, it, there, there's going to be a reality check at some point. On top of that, Xi Jinping doesn't want to leave, look weak uh, before the towards autumn of this year. Right. And if something goes wrong with the Chinese economy, then his his control over power uh, becomes untenable because there are factions within the Communist Party which have been dormant right now, but which will come out in the open once the crisis in China, which will be pinned on to somebody and to be Xi Jinping, comes, uh, you know, comes very starkly visible. Right. So, so it's a long uh, list, definitely, and a host of factors <laughs> at play. Uh, but appreciate very much your helping us better understand uh, all of those factors. Atul Anija, thanks very much for joining us here on the broadcast.